All right, so I welcome you again uh, in this class of uh, coordination chemistry, and we have been discussing the bonding theories. In the bonding theories, uh, we were discussing crystal field theory. Okay, in fact, we had a, a quite good discussion on the uh, how the d-orbital splitting takes place under various geometries in the crystal field uh, theory, right? And then we started explaining uh, like uh, some of the properties like uh, spectra, uh, right? The, how the, what are the factors that affect uh, D orbital splitting, that is crystal field splitting, uh, right? Uh, the factors that were affecting, you know, we understood that these are the, uh, the nature of the metal ion, the nature of the ligand, right? And uh, of course, if the oxidation state of the uh, metal ion, all these factors they affect crystal field splitting. And after that, uh, we have also seen how to calculate crystal field stabilization energy. Okay, so and we understood that uh, the relative stability, if you would like to find out for different uh, transition metal complexes. So you can find out the crystal field stabilization energy and by comparing, uh, you know, which uh, metal complex is expected to be more stable and which one is not. All right. So now continuing with the crystal field theory, uh, the applications of crystal field theory, like what are the property that we, property that we can easily explain uh, by crystal field theory, okay. So, one of the important topic is uh, the yan teller distortion. In the yan teller distortion, is nothing but uh, there are, as I told you, there are so many uh, transition metal complexes, and uh, all of them do not exhibit the regular structure. Regular structure means like if there is an octahedral structure, all the bond lengths in the normal octahedral has to be equal. Okay. However, most of the time most of the time they are found unequal okay like for example if you take the axial bond length and the equatorial bond length represented as a and e if a is equal to e we will say this is a normal octahedral however so let's say a means axial bond length is more than e okay this is a type of tetragonal distortion which is called z out Z out because the bond lengths along the Z direction are longer. So it is called Z out distortion. Or it could be just the reverse of it. The reverse of it means the bond lengths around uh, along the X along this Z axis, okay, A is less than E, less than the bond lengths in the equatorial plane. So there are there are two, it is so called a tetragonal distortion. Uh, Octahedral complexes can be a subject to tetragonal or trigonal distortion also, leading to less symmetrical but more stable structure. Okay, remember this. These are less symmetrical structure, but they are more stable structures. Okay, so how do we explain? How do we explain this? Okay, first let's see that uh, what are the configurations that generally show uh, this yan teller distortion and why we are calling it yan teller distortion. Okay, because there is a theorem that has explained why this distortion occurs. Okay, that theorem is given by those uh, two gentlemen, uh, Jan Teller. That's why it is called a Jan Teller distortion. Okay, so for example, you see the D1 case. Whenever you see, just remember this point that whenever you see an unsymmetrical filling of D electrons, unsymmetrical filling of D electrons, whether it is D2G, whether it is EG you are going to observe some distortion in the structure. So this is related to the unsymmetrical filling of the D electrons. Like for example, if there is only one electron D1 system, this is unsymmetrical filling because one orbital has electron, other orbitals do not have. So it is asymmetry, right? D2 is also having asymmetry. D3 will not. So D1 will show distortion, D2 will show distortion. D4 low spin can show distortion. D5 low spin can show distortion. Right? 
D5 high spin, all the orbitals are equally filled, so there is no distortion normally. D6 high spin, yes, it can show distortion. D7 high spin, yes, it can also show distortion. D7 low spin also can show distortion. Okay. In an octahedral field, in an octahedral field, you know, there are two types of distortions. As I told you, the elongation and the compression. Right? Z out or Z in. So one is that how do you predict whether there will be a Z in or Z out? Or can we predict it? That is one thing, right? And um, so as I told you that there are two types of distortion. But let's take off only, let's say, Z out elongation, which is also very common also. Okay. Z out elongation. This is normal octahedron, right? E, G, and T to G. This is normal octahedron. Okay, if there is a weak distortion, this means there is a weak field ligand. However, there is unsymmetrical filling of the electrons, but ligand fields are weak, so it will result into a weak distortion, as you can see over here. However, the distortion could be large, it could be a stronger distortion. Okay, that strong distortion generally occurs in octahedral system whenever the uh, you see the ligands uh, or the d orbitals or the eg orbitals right dx square minus y square and dz square those orbitals are having the unsymmetrical filling because uh, those orbitals are the one which are directly facing ligands so the ligands which are directly affecting them okay if they are stronger if they are stronger they can cause because they are directly affecting the orbitals they can cause more distortion so anytime in octahedral system if there is the unsymmetrical filling in the eg set of orbital then there is going to be a stronger distortion or if there is a unsymmetrical filling of a, a t2g set of orbital then there is going to be a um, weaker distortion okay or weaker elongation okay all right an example you can see that uh, this is a uh, you know nickel hexaqua complex you see over here so all six nickel oxygen bonds are equal that is around 2.05 so no distortion so that means a d8 system is a weak field again like water or not so in no distortion okay in fact if you look at a d8 configuration d8 config configuration is very symmetric right so it is expected that there will be no distortion copper on the other hand copper 2 is a d9 system it has unsymmetrical filling of electron in the eg set so it is expected it will have its distortion in that too a strong distortion okay and that is why you see over here you can see these two bonds in the axial direction the dead z axis 2.45 while in the plane the xy plane the bonds are around two minus one a huge distortion it is z elongation case okay it is a d9 system unsymmetrical filling of electrons in the eg orbital leading to a strong distortion in this case okay how do you explain it okay and that is why this is called yan teller distortion because two, gen two gentlemen this yan and teller they were two mathematicians they gave a theorem okay there, there are so many theorems in the mathematics they gave a theorem what what did the theorem say is that any non-linear molecular system any non-linear molecular system in a degenerate electronic state right remember they are t2g and dg they are having a degenerate electronic state will be unstable right will be unstable and will undergo distortion to form a system of lower symmetry and lower energy thereby removing the degeneracy okay so whenever you see unsymmetrical filling of electrons the degeneracy will be removed and system will move towards it lower symmetry and lower energy uh, configuration all right so you can see over here so in the octahedral case again i am discussing again again because it is very very common and uh, easily we can understand it t2g and eg normal splitting of the octahedral system however if let's say uh, there is if there is let's say x square minus y square orbital that means the x and y in the x and y plane that is stabilized in the x y orbital will be down or lower in energy right so here the dz 
DJ, uh, so DJ is square orbital is expected to have uh, you know the less number of uh, electrons and x square minus y square is expected to have more number of unpaired electrons being lower in let's say the energy so it is resulting to a jet compression so there will be too short and for long ones just the other situation is if let's say the jet square dj square orbital in lower energy let's say a d9 case right and if this will have two electrons this will have one electron okay so hello uh, and uh, accordingly the xz and yz will be stabilized x y will be stabilized all right so in this case because dj square will have more number of uh, electrons it will, it will be facing the ligands more so in this case the two ligands along the z direction will be you know at a longer distance so two long and four short one so please remember this dj square lower it has to be jet elongation dx square minus y square lower in energy it has to be a uh, jet compression okay if the x y component if the orbitals in the, in the x y directions are stabilized jet compression if the orbitals along z direction, z square, z y z, if they are stabilized, you will see a z elongation. All right. All kind of cases are there, like copper two system. Normally, I give it say z elongation. Okay. Although there are some cases of that compression also, but mostly it is a z elongation case. Right. So we can see that the the two electrons are over here. After the d nine, if you start filling. Two electrons here and one electron over here, so it will result into a z elongation case. Okay, so static versus dynamic and color distortion. So have you, I hope that you understood why there is a uh, why there is a distortion. Okay, unsymmetrical filling is there, but you know that now whenever there is a unsymmetrical filling, uh, unsymmetrical filling of the electrons, the degeneracy will be removed uh, according to the uh, Yantler theorem. Because these are non-linear system, they will undergo distortion, and a system of lower energy and lower symmetry will be created. All right. D1 system, let's say it is T2G set. If we are talking about octahedral geometry, it is a T2G set, single electron, unsymmetrical filling. We can expect a, uh, we can expect a, you know, a distortion. It says it's a compression over here because it is likely if you see the x y. And xz, yz, xz, yz, and xy. Either way, either this component is xy component is stabilized, or the xz, yz component is stabilized. However, if let's say there is only one electron, then this will be favored. Why? Because there is only one orbital over here. If there are two electrons, then this will be favored. This is the natural. And in general, nature will favor symmetry. If you see. Okay, you see the tea leaves, right? You see the flower, you see our human body, right? There is a lot of symmetry there. So here, if you have a single electron, there is a single orbital, as simple as that. So this will be the case if you get compression. That's why D1 is likely to have a jet compression. D2, as I told you, in this D2, it is likely that these two, X Z Y Z, will be of lower energy because there are two orbital, two electrons, symmetrical thing, kind of. Okay. So unsymmetrical but symmetrical filling, right? Then if there are three orbitals and two electrons, so two will come down, one will go up. Again, there is a symmetric system, although it's a less symmetric system. So D2 is configuration will lead to elongation case. D3, symmetrical filling, no antenna distortion. However, in all the three cases are expected, if the first two cases are expected to have a very, you know, a very uh, weaker distortion because the T2G set is not facing the ligands directly, right? It is the EG set which faces the EG set of orbital that faces the ligands directly. So, in these cases, you are expected to have a weak distortion. However, if let's say you excite this electron, if you are carrying out some experiment and you are exciting this electron or exciting one of these two electrons. Then one electron is excited to the EG set now. Right? So my excited state is having a, a stronger antenna distortion. Right? So sometimes when you are carrying out, let's say, spectroscopy or something, you can expect more distortion if, let's say, it's not very easy, it's not very difficult to populate the excited state. 
Okay, so sometimes when the excited state contributes to a to a distortion, this is called a dynamic Yankara distortion. It's not static, dynamic. Right? Because it is excited state contribution. When electron is jumping, that time you come to see this dynamic frontier distortion. There are many cases when the ground state is not having that kind of distortion, but excited state has more distortion. This is resulting in a dynamic Yantala distortion. You can further see occurrence of Yantala distortion that when do you expect a weak, when do you expect a, uh, expect a stronger Yantala distortion. So we see number of electrons, one, weak, weak, right? High spin Yantala, low spin. High spin, low spin is not there in case of one, two, and three. Only in case of four, five, and six, and seven, you will see a high spin, low spin change. Right? Three, in the three, there is no high spin, no low spin. Right, so you can expect no distortion. You can get symmetrical theory. In case of four, high spin will show a strong because there is a electron that is occupying. You can see the high spin case. There is an electron occupying the EG side of orbital, which is directly facing the ligands. So you can expect it, a stronger angular distortion. Okay, D5, high spin, no distortion, symmetrical filling. Right, D5, low spin, yes, it will have distortion, but weak because. Uh, the unsymmetrical filling is in the TTT side. Okay. Similarly, if you see the, uh, let's say, other case, D7 case, D7 low spin, is strong distortion. D7 low spin, is strong. D7 high spin, weak. Because D7 high spin, you put an electron over here. So, EG set is symmetrical filling. TTT set is unsymmetrical filling. So, you see a weaker distortion in a D7 high spin. Okay, D9 case, it is strong, always, it is always strong, whether it is known that uh, high spin or low spin, because it has to be occurring in the, always in the same state, there is no low spin or high spin here, it is D9 system, it is always having a strong distortion. What are the system having weak antenna effect, D1 system, high spin, like, right, but there is no excited state contribution, mostly it is the normal situation. A D1 system will have a weaker Yantala distortion. D2 uh, also D4 low spin will have B and D5 low spin will have B, uh, distortion because unsymmetrical filling is in the uh, TTG side of orbit, which are not facing the ligands directly. And a T2G in the D, D6 case also, the normal high spin case, right, is all, all having a weak distortion. T2G uh, D7 case, D7 high spin again, it is a weak distortion. Okay, so I guess just by looking at the configuration, okay, if you know that uh, what kind of ligands are there, whether they are going to cause a high spin or low spin uh, configuration, you can easily predict that which case is going to have a stronger distortion and which case is going to have a weaker distortion. Okay, very good. You remember that whenever there is a you know, compressed compression, this is the electro, this is the electronic uh, uh, configuration. This is the uh, this is the D9 case especially. If that is the situation, if it is the compressed, that means a uh, D S square minus Y square is lower in energy. If it is elongated, a D J square is having lower in energy. Okay, two electrons here, so a ligand will face repulsion from two electrons. So has to be longer along the z axis. Okay, which is normal. And the ligands are not causing much. If they are weak free ligands, will not cause much distortion. And it may be that even if it is D9 system, but it may not show any distortion because the ligands are very weak in case for ligands. Are weak. Okay. So there are a couple of factors. I hope you are able to distinguish now that if you have to see the the nature of the ligand, you have to see high spin, low spin, you have to see the electronic configuration. If you put all these things together, you can come to a right explanation for the distortion, distortion structure. All right, some more examples you can see. Octahedral geometry distortion, as I told you, normal octahedral, Z in, that means dx square minus square, the xy component is stabilized. You remember there are two orbitals having an xy component dxy and dx square minus y square. If they are having more number of unpaired electron, 
the bone length along the x y will be higher okay and that will result into z compression or x y elongation or if there is a you see the z out that is elongation case z square orbital or the z component orbital are going to be lower in energy but they are going to have more number of electrons all right so again again just the same thing i am just showing you that a normal system versus a decompressed system versus a z elongation system okay if somebody asks you can you write down the d orbital splitting in a z elongation case you should be able to write z elongation means keep the z square down okay some people get confused over here that uh so z square down z square should be high in energy because of this no don't go into that z square is lower in energy in z elongation because then only it will have more number of electrons then it will have more is more you know yeah repulsion from the ligands to have the longer bond distances along the z direction all right jtd in d6 and d7 case i told you d6 low spin you don't expect any angular distortion okay uh, d6 high spin you do expect a weaker distortion because uh, unsymmetrical filling is there in the t2g set while the eg set is symmetrical all right so here you can see if you excite electron from d6 to eg then eg will have a unsymmetrical filling and t2g will have a symmetrical filling so d6 system like i and 2 i spin case normally they have a dynamic angular distortion because electron can be excited easily from uh, t2g to eg set and resulting in configuration is a an unsymmetrical unsymmetrical filling field eg configuration which generally result into a more severe distortions d7 low spin yes it will distortion because unsymmetrical filling in the eg uh, set of orbital mm -hmm. can lead to a more stronger distortion d7 high spin uh, you can see unsymmetrical filling is in the t2g set so you do not expect a severe distortion but you can expect a elongation z elongation d8 system i told you generally there is no distortion however if you excite electron you know from here to here you might expect in some cases the dynamic nature of the angular distortion d9 case mostly distorted because the eg set is always unsymmetrical right d10 no distortion everything is completely cool d0 d5 high spin d10 system you do not expect much distortion because of the symmetrical filling of the d orbitals All right. Some more examples are given on here. Proper BR2. Four brom bromine ligands, so bromide ligands are 240, 2 at 318. What is the case? Elongation or compression? It is a jet elongation because two bonds axial are elongated, right? Jet elongation is more common. That means dz square orbital is lower in energy. Okay, so it will be dx jet dy jet dxy dz square dx square minus y square. That is the Uh, splitting of the orbitals. CuCl2 2 at 193, 2 at 228, 2 at 295. Very unsymmetrical. It's very unsymmetrical. See, but still it is a case of elongation because two chloride at 295. Okay, other four are. So you see, there is huge distortion, but still it is a that elongated thing. I would say. Copper chloride having cesium copper chloride 4Cl232 at 265. That means again it is a case of z elongation because two bonds are longer than the other four, right? So here you see so four copper sulfate for ammonia 491205 12391337. This is very hugely distorted structure. All the distortion you can easily consider. You can easily explain by considering the uh, angular distortion. All right. So this is another application of the uh, of the crystal field theory that you can explain the distortion distorted structures also very easily. Okay. And this phenomena of angular distortion, as I told you, the dynamic angular distortion and all those things. When we discuss the spectra of asymmetric complexes, you will see that JT distortion can again. Can be very useful concept when you are explaining the some when you are explaining some, explaining 
the distort the UV within the spectra of anti complex. Okay, you enter the distortion as you have seen. Okay, let's see over here. There were initially two energy levels, but because of the because of the distortion now, how many energy levels are there? One, two, three, four. So obviously there are four energy levels. So obviously there will be more number of electronic transitions are possible, right? So you can see more spectral features in your spectra, right? So that is how these things are useful in explaining the experimental data. Well, now we can move on some use this crystal field theory and explain some more properties of uh, transition metal complexes. For example, enthalpy of hydration. Right? If you take transition metal ion, let's say M2 plus plus add a lot of water, a complex metal hexaequable form. Right? So it is called enthalpy of hydration, whatever energy is coming out from here, that is called enthalpy of hydration. More is the tendency of getting hydrated, more enthalpy of hydration will be, more energy will be coming out. Right, so this varies. If you just see this graph, if you see the D0, D5, and D10 configuration, you can put a linear, you can put a, a line that means they are expected to have a linear increase. Okay, but that is not the case. Most of the time, you will see a double hump curve. Okay, the green line in the graph is the straight line, and this red line is the double hump curve. Heat of hydration so two humps consistent with the expected CFST. If you consider crystal field stabilization energy, because here the metal complex is formed, the octatal complex is formed, so there will be some CFSC will be there. If that's a D1 case, minus 0.4 delta O, uh, D2 system, let's say, D2 system will have a uh, minus 0.8 delta O, so more stabilized. When they are more stabilized, more enthalpy of hydration will be there. Right? Because when a more stable complex is formed, more energy will be coming out. So that is why when it comes to D5, no CFSC. Again, D6, some CFSC. If you keep increasing up to D8, D9 less, and D10 zero. That's why you go up, CFSC increases, and the of hydration increases. CFSC goes to zero, again come down, again up. That's why you see the double thumb curve. So if you calculate the CFSC in each case, you will get the same curve, same double thumb curve. Okay. Instead of plotting the delta hydration, if you plot CFSC, you will get the same curve. Okay, double thumb curve. So you can explain the so CFSC. If the CFSC is more, more enthalpy of hydration will be coming out. More energy is coming out to form a metal electro, metal complex. All right. So that's how CFSC CFT is helpful in explaining these properties. Any gradient. Okay, when you are moving across a period, right? Then generally, what happens? The ionic radii because Electrons are entering into the same energy levels, but effective nuclear charge keep increasing. So generally there is a uh, generally, generally there, there is a steady decrease in the ionic radius. However, steady decrease is only in the case of calcium, magnesium, and zinc, which are having no CFSC again. Because of the CFSC and because of the electrons are occupying not the very center, but uh, some energy, some energy down, let's say minus 0 0.4, minus 0 0.8, or minus 1.2. D1, D2, D3 case. So they are more stabilized. In fact, because they are occupying a lesser energy level, their ionic radii will also decrease compared to normal case. That's why you will see again double hump curve in case of ionic radii because this is also connected to the crystal field stabilization energy. All right, you have to see where the electrons are going. Whether they are going to EG set or they are going to T2G set. Going to T2G T2 set means there will be somewhat less ionic radii. In case of the strong field ligands, such as cyanide, there will be a steady decrease in the ionic radii because all the fixed electrons are occupying T2G case, let's say, in case of D6 case. Okay, so you can easily explain by considering the crystal field stabilization energy, the concept of crystal field theory, you can easily explain this term. Crystal field theory, ionic radii, as we have discussed it. Uh, lattice energy, right? Lattice energy of let's say the salts. Remember, this theory was actually created for the ionic solids. So, the salts of metals, right? Let's say the dipyrite salts of <coughs> first row transition metals, it will show lattice energy. What is this lattice energy? The formation of the one mole of the ionic solid, right? The energy released in the formation of the one mole of the ionic solid. Lattice energy expected to increase continuously across the transition series as the ionic radii of the metal decrease. 
that is energy proportional to 1 upon r plus 2 r minus. That is how the theoretical, if you remember the bond and the equation to calculate the that is energy, the it is inversely proportional to the um, ionic radii. Okay, so ionic radii keep decreasing, right? As we have seen over here. Ionic radii keep decreasing, so that means lattice energy will keep increasing. If ionic radii, if the lattice, if the CFSC is zero, the CFSC is zero, that means there is no there is no ionic radii is not also not like uh, increasing with some normal ionic radii. That means you will see a normal CF, normal lattice energy. However, if there is extra stabilization due to crystal field stabilization energy, then you will see a higher lattice energy. Only D0, D5, D and D10, they don't have D5 high spin. They do not have any CFSC. So there is no extra stabilization. So there is no extra CFSC also. There is no extra lattice energy also. So all these things are connected. All right. So you can easily explain why there is higher lattice energy in some cases, why there is a double hump curve is being observed in case of the in case of the experimental observed, observed lattice energy. You can easily explain that. Right. So see suddenly you are able to explain almost all the properties of transmetric complexity. What are those properties? Geometry, understood, number of bonds, shape, color. Yes, we have understood all these properties. Magnetic property, spectra, structure, stability, reactivity, high spin and low spin nature, splitting of d orbitals, effect of ligand time. Yes, we have understood. Most of these properties we have understood if we consider uh, the concept of crystal field theory. Okay. So that means is it a perfect theory? No, it's not perfect theory. There are few things that are not explained by the uh, this thing also. So, what are the limitations of the crystal field theory? It's a very successful model in explaining the formation, structure, color, and magnetic properties of coordination compounds to a large extent. However, from the assumption that the ligands are point charging, it didn't consider at all the covalent bonding. It followed that anionic ligands would exert the greatest splitting effect. It is not the case. Like, for example, water is a stronger field ligand than hydroxide, but hydroxide is anionic. It should have more interaction with the positively charged metal. That is not the case. If you look at the spectrochemical series, you will see some of the negatively charged ligands are weaker field than the neutral. In fact, carbon monoxide, which is a neutral ligand, is the strongest ligand. Right? So this order was not explained by this assumption of considering the uh, that ligands and metals are the point charges. I need purely I need concept is cannot explain that. Further, it does not take account the covalent character of bonding between the ligand and the central atom. These are related. There are some of the weaknesses of crystal field theory, which are explained by ligand field theory and the molecular potential. All right. Nephilogetic series. What is this nephilogetic effect? Okay, it is called the cloud expansion. Okay. Uh, we will come across these parameters like Raka parameter B. Okay, B in a complex, B in a free ion. Okay, these are basic, basically electronic repulsion parameters. So, electronic repulsion, elect electronic electronic repulsion are more when the electrons are closer. If electrons are at more distance, that means uh, the repulsion will be lower. Right? So, this nephrogetic effect is basically a cloud expanding effect. So, when you have metal complexes, the, the inter-electronic repulsion is less. That means the orbitals are now combining. When orbital overlap is taking place, that means there is a covalent bonding is there, right? So nephrogetic effect. That means the, the reduced repulsion, reduced interelectronic repulsion of the d electrons density. Okay, that was not able. To, that this theory could not explain. So the nephrogetic effect was not able to be explained by this theory. So you see the nephrogetic parameter of the ligand is over here. So you can make separate, like free metal ion or free ligands. You can make a separate nephrogetic ligand series. So what is the parameter of the B, right? So which one is having more repulsion, which one is having uh, higher repulsion? All these things are there. So whenever there is, let's say, iodide, bromide, they are having more, uh, basically, more covalent character, right? Uh, fluoride, 
and they have more ionic character, right? Nephelogetic metal series, platinum 4, cobalt 3, they are going to have more covalent nature compared to, let's say, manganese 2 or platinum 2, they will be more ionic in nature. So, this is what the nephelogetic effect is basically, it is called the cloud expanding effect, okay? So, crystal field theory was not able to explain this cloud expanding effect. The term nephelogetic means cloud expanding. The idea is that the more covalent the metal ligand bonding, the more the unpaired electrons of the metal are spread over the ligand and the lower is the energy required to spin free of these electrons. Okay, so I hope you understood the this nephelogetic series. Thus, so this is basically nothing when metal electrons are having only the metal orbitals, right? Ligand electrons are having ligand orbitals. When they are combining together, right, the bigger orbitals will be formed, right? Bigger, now you can see these are clouds basically. The bigger cloud will form, okay? The cloud expanding will be there. That's why you will see a lot less repulsion. Yeah. This is observed phenomena. That's why this is crystal field theory cannot explain it because crystal field theory is saying that this is what the ligand is providing. And they are point charges. They are not having any interaction at all uh, in terms of their orbital overlap is not there. That's why nephelogetics effect, nephelogetic series cannot be explained by the uh, crystal field theory. Crystal field theory also do not explain the super hyperfine splitting in EPR. So, what is this uh, super hyperfine splitting? And first, before that, you need to know what is EPR. EPR is nothing but the electron paramagnetic resonance. Like you see the proton, uh, like nuclear magnetic resonance, with the, uh, you know, when you put a proton in the magnetic field, in this case, you put an electron in the magnetic field. So, various energy levels will be there. And when the particles will be excited from one energy level to another, okay, there will be electron paramagnetic resonance effect will be there. The spectrum, the resulting spectra is known as electron EPR spectra. Okay, so EPR spectra is let's say there is a metal, it is only for the system having unpaired electron. If there is a metal ion having unpaired electron, these are the ones which are showing a copper complexes. Copper complexes will <coughs> should show it has one unpaired electron. It should be showing only one uh, peak in the EPR spectra, but it is not. It shows multiple peaks because it has the electron is now interacting with the nuclear spin of copper. That's why the four lines over here. And it is also further split because of the effect of the ligands. <coughs> Various ligands like nitrogen, right? And uh, they are having, okay, or chloride, they are having uh, the nuclear spin. So, if an electron present on the metal is interacting with the nuclear spin of the ligand, that means there is a huge overlap of the orbitals. Okay? So, that kind of phenomena cannot be explained by the crystal field theory by considering this ionic model. Okay? You have to bring in the concept of covalent bonding. Okay? So, these are the some of the uh, limitations of the crystal field theory. These limitations were explained by the molecular orbital theory. Okay, so we need to discuss molecular orbital theory of transmetric complexes that we will be doing in the uh, next class. Okay, so I hope that you understood the, we had a good and detailed discussion on the crystal field theory. Okay, I would suggest that you go through all the postulates, all the things, all the lectures that we have taken on this theory. It will be a very useful theory. In fact, crystal field theory is more practical to use even compared to molecular orbital theory, because molecular orbital diagrams are not that easy to make as a d orbital splitting diagrams are. Okay, so I suggest that you practice and you read all these uh, uh, all these modules that I have given to you, and uh, and then you will be able to explain a lot of properties of transmetric complexes. Okay, we will. I will see you in the next class uh, of uh, molecular.